I'm John McKee, editor of Messianic Apologetics, and I would like to welcome you to this episode of Messianic Insider. Today, our topic, how do we guard against replacement theology, part two. Several weeks ago, we discussed this very issue. How do we guard against replacement theology? But much of how we approached the controversial subject of replacement theology, supersessionism, was in surveying a number of theological resources and approaches which are seen and encountered in one's messianic experience. Today, moving forward in the discussion of replacement theology, it's important that we review some specific examples which can come up or be encountered in one's messianic experience, particularly involving non-Jewish believers within the sphere of things messianic. Messianic Jewish believers who encounter non-Jews intersecting or involving themselves in some way in things messianic are going to be looking at them very carefully to see if they can detect any tinge or any indication of supersessionism or replacement theology. Now, as we discussed in part one, there is a sliding scale regarding replacement theology. Some are of the opinion that unless you hold to a rigid bilateral ecclesiology of all believers being part of the Commonwealth of Israel, but the Commonwealth of Israel composed of the Jewish community slash the Messianic Jewish community and the Christian church, you may be guilty of replacement theology. More likely, you are to encounter Messianic Jews who will be suspicious if you take on some kind of an identity as quote-unquote Israel, which is unqualified. That tends to be more what is witnessed, and so we'll be getting into that in a few moments. Non-Jewish people within the sphere of influence of things Messianic need to be highly aware of Messianic Jewish believers who are looking at their actions, looking at what they're saying, to detect, to look for indicators that they may be affected by replacement theology. And frequently, I think many non-Jewish believers who come into the Messianic community, when they hear or when they employ concepts like the Commonwealth of Israel, Ephesians 2, 11 through 13, grafted in Romans 11, 16, 17, or that they are fellow citizens with the saints, or even the Israel of God, Galatians 6, 16. They don't know, and again, this may be dependent on a particular setting, a particular congregation, a particular venue. They don't know if the Messianic Jews present are going to be welcoming of them or going to be resistant in some way. So how do we guard against replacement theology is tied up in terms employed, but also actions demonstrated. As I have been sorting through, how do we talk about this? I did run across uh, some notes, which I had put together for part one that I overlooked and we wouldn't have had the time to discuss anyway. So that's why we've got a part two. But they listed some very specific things we need to be aware of in our Messianic experience, especially if we are non-Jewish and if we need a 
refresh regarding why are we here and what are we doing. This past Passover 2023, any of you who are on social media, in particular uh, what I encountered many times on TikTok, and I don't spend that much time on TikTok, uh, there were a number of Jewish people, rabbis, individual Jews. It's fair to say that they would sit at the far left end of the ideological spectrum. And I don't know who was contacting them or commenting on their different posts. They may have been Hebrew Roots people, or I doubt they would have been non-Jewish people involved in Messianic things. But they were people who were saying, you know, Passover is for all of God's people. And perhaps referring to some of Paul's statements in 1 Corinthians, perhaps referring to Yeshua holding a Passover meal with his disciples before his arrest and execution. And these different Jewish people were pushing back. And these were liberal Jews. And they were saying, no, Passover is for ethnic Jews only. And Messianic Jews are not Jews. They're playing some kind of cosplay. And they have appropriated Jewish tradition inappropriately. And we find that not only offensive, but anti-Semitic. Now, this is something which can be used against the Messianic Jewish community every bit as much as non-Jewish believers within the sphere of influence or involved with the Messianic movement. The Jewish community as a whole does not consider Messianic Jews to be Jewish. The Jewish community considers Messianic Jews to be Christian and that they need to act like Christians and not try to appropriate Jewish tradition or Jewish custom. The Messianic Jewish community, if you look at its history, was founded by Jewish believers in Israel's Messiah, not just to present the good news of Israel's Messiah to the Jewish community in a Jewish context, but also to stress that Jewish believers in Yeshua as Israel's Messiah can indeed continue to be Jewish. And that has been met with a huge amount of controversy from both Jewish and Christian quarters. Now, Christian quarters have understandably been uh, loosening on this. Of course, Jewish believers in Jesus can continue to live as Jewish people in observance of their ancient traditions and customs rooted in the Old Testament. The question, of course, as we get closer and closer to Yeshua's return and we see many non-Jewish believers being drawn into Messianic things, things of Torah. Why are they doing this? And are they guilty of appropriating something that isn't theirs? Are they in error for doing things that historically uh, Christianity has deemed unnecessary? And you see a variety of responses in the Messianic community. On the whole, though, uh, and this is my experience over many years, the Messianic Jewish community knows that it cannot just be hard shell negative to non-Jewish believers partaking of outward things of Torah as they grow in faith and as they are genuinely moved by the Holy Spirit and as they are sincerely called into Messianic congregations and assemblies. There's always been a place for non-Jewish believers in the sphere of Messianic things. Without non-Jewish believers, the Messianic community would not exist because it would not have a base of material resources to have its congregations and to have its ministries and to have its large conference events. So there's always been a place for non-Jewish believers, and the basic question has always been, are you called? Especially as this is an emerging faith community, and if we're honest with ourselves, we don't entirely know 
what it's going to fully emerge into. There are some who believe that Messianic Judaism needs to emerge into another formal branch of Judaism. Others consider this to be the end-time move of God, which is going to herald a massive salvation of Jewish people, something that will culminate in the return of Israel's Messiah to planet Earth. So, even though it doubtlessly has things in common with mainstream Judaism seen out there, as well as different strands of evangelicalism. It is ultimately a salvation historical movement with a very significant mission and purpose. And so, of course, you're going to see non-Jewish believers involve themselves in things of Torah and wanting to live closer to the kind of life that Yeshua and his first followers adhered to, fellowshipping in one accord with Jewish believers being reckoned as one new man or one new humanity. We've heard all of these kinds of things. Uh, but inevitable, inevitably, when the question of ecclesiology, the study of God's elect comes up, what does it mean? Jew and non-Jew, part of the commonwealth of Israel, fellow citizens with the saints. What does it mean for a non-Jewish believer to be grafted in as a wild olive branch? What does it mean to be part of the Israel of God. And this is where you see, at times, various shades of gray ambiguity from Messianic uh, Jewish believers. What does that mean? Uh, And when you see, in particular, uh, non-Jewish believers get overly zealous, uh, you can encounter people, particularly those who come from a dispensational type of background where God has two groups of elect, Israel and the church, and they get a hold of something like Commonwealth of Israel or grafted in, and then they just start saying, I am Israel. And of course, to any Jewish person, and even a Messianic Jewish believer, they can frequently be taken aback by that, and very quickly offended by that. And such a person can have accusations of replacement theology or supersessionism lodged at them. And there's no shortage of teachings on the internet, especially memes from the Hebrew Roots movement, which is going to stress that non-Jewish believers in Israel's Messiah are Israel in an unqualified way. For many years... I have stressed, especially in discussions over ecclesiology and the model which I support, which would be called an enlarged kingdom realm model, focused on James's words of Acts 15, 15 through 18, regarding the tabernacle of David, a restored 12 tribes of Israel at the center. This is based in Amos 9, 11, and 12 and enlarged borders, welcoming in the righteous from the nations. As much as I would stress that we are all part, as believers in Israel's Messiah, of the same kingdom, I have also had to say that a non-Jewish believer must never, ever say that he or she is just Israel unqualified. If you qualify what it means to be a part of Israel, i.e. a part of Israel's commonwealth, fellow citizens with the saints, a wild olive branch grafted into the olive tree, part of the Israel of God, then you have stressed that you are part of the people for whom the Messiah is returning And you also hopefully have stressed that being a part of that kingdom is not isolated unto yourself. You are a part of a kingdom with fellow non-Jewish believers as well as Jewish believers. And you also have a specific mission to be involved with in the days leading up to the Messiah's return. Now, in the Hebrew Roots Movement, 
you frequently will not hear those kinds of things. It's simply stressed, non-Jews are Israel. And to a Messianic Jewish believer who is open-minded and wants to be in close communion and fellowship and working together with non-Jewish believers, they can rightfully be offended by that and even be frightened by it. In my resource, uh, are non-Jewish believers really a part of Israel, which lays out what I would call a an enlarged kingdom realm of Israel ecclesiology. In some of the closing sections, I talk about this, non-Jewish believers really being a part of Israel. I have this to say. Is it at all possible to offer Bible readers a feasible non-supersessionist alternative meaning a non-replacement theology alternative to either dispensationalism or bilateral ecclesiology. It is possible to present an alternative to many individual people in the current messianic community because of the complicated religious politics of today's messianic community. It is likely not too possible among all leaders but is surely possible among many individual people and families. Any non-supersessionist alternative of ecclesiology, the study of God's elect, which is to be presented, has to recognize three valid points. Number one, the establishment of the state of Israel in 1948 was according to Bible prophecy, Isaiah 66.8 as is the return of scores of Jewish people to the land of Israel. Non-Jewish believers have a biblical responsibility and duty to support the state of Israel and stand up against anti-Semitism and anti-Judaism in our world. Number two, ethnic Jewish people or ethnic Israelites alone have a biblical right to permanent residence within the Holy Land. Joshua chapters 15 through 21, Ezekiel 47, 13 to 48, 35, with a small few exceptions likely only determined following the return of Yeshua, Ezekiel 47, 22, and 23. Number three, non-Jewish believers in Israel's Messiah are to be regarded as incorporated into an expanded or enlarged kingdom realm of Israel. Amos 9, 11 and 12. Acts 15, 15 through 18. Rightly considered to be the commonwealth of Israel, Ephesians 2, 11 through 13, or the Israel of God, Galatians 6, 16, specifically likened unto the wild branches of Israel's olive tree. Romans 11, 16 through 24. In his 2005 work, post-missionary Messianic Judaism. Mark S. Kinzer was entirely right to recognize, quote, when the ecclesia contained a visible Jewish nucleus, its right to claim continuity with Israel was reasonable and not necessarily supersessionist. When that nucleus disappeared, the claim to direct continuity with Israel became spiritual and abstract and easily morphed into a claim to be a replacement for Israel, unquote. So yes, I closed up that section with a quotation from uh, the book Post-Missionary Messianic Judaism by Mark Kinzer. Uh, while not a supporter of the bilateral ecclesiology model, I do nevertheless uh, recognize that Mark Kinzer had a very valid point there. Without actual ethnic Jewish people involved in the body of Messiah. It's very difficult for non-Jewish people to claim some kind of continuity or involvement with Israel without it quickly becoming replacement theology or supersessionist. And indeed, one of the things you see across, and we'll discuss this uh, in some more detail, 
across the different non-Jewish Torah movements is precisely that. You only see non-Jewish people involved in them. You really don't see uh, Jewish people involved. Or for that matter, a concern for Israel issues, Jewish issues, Jewish salvation, etc. A non-Jewish believer must never say that he or she is just Israel. You can say you are a part of Israel and then quickly define that as Commonwealth of Israel grafted into the olive tree, Israel of God, you're part of the restoration of David's tabernacle. But if you just say, as a non-Jewish person involved in the sphere of influence of Messianic things, I am Israel, expect Messianic Jewish believers to accuse you of replacement theology. And that's not something we want to see. Now, what does it mean? Or what are some of the important things involving what it means for non-Jewish believers to be grafted in? Uh, all across the internet, all across social media, you will doubtlessly see it stress that non-Jewish believers are grafted into the olive tree. There are channels called grafted in. There is a non-Jewish Torah fellowship, although I think uh, they're calling themselves a Christian fellowship, but it's called the Grafted Church. Uh, they're all over social media. What does it mean to be grafted in, and, and what are some of the things which commonly get left out of the equation, especially when we deal with more popular or more well-known channels out there or voices. It's clear enough when you read the Tanakh or Old Testament that the olive tree used as a reference point in Romans chapter 11 that the olive tree is Israel. Let me uh, read to you some uh, passages from the Tanakh here. Jeremiah 11, 16 and 17. The Lord called your name a green olive tree, beautiful in fruit and form. With the noise of a great tumult, he has kindled fire on it and its branches are worthless. The Lord of hosts who planted you has pronounced evil against you because of the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah, which they have done to provoke me by offering up sacrifices to Baal. And also, Hosea 14, 1 through 7. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, Take away all iniquity and receive us graciously, that we may present the fruit of our lips. Assyria will not save us. We will not ride on horses. Nor will we say again, Our God, to the work of our hands, for in you the orphan finds mercy. I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. I will be like the dew of Israel. He will blossom like the lily, and he will take root from the cedars of Lebanon. His shoots will sprout, and his beauty will be like the olive tree, and his fragrance like the cedars of Lebanon. Those who live in his shadow will again raise grain, and they will blossom like the vine. His renown will be like the wine of Lebanon." Both references New American Standard. Now, frequently in Paul's discussion of Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11, it does need to be recognized how the main issue that the apostle is having to sort through is how many of his own flesh and blood, his own fellow ethnic Jewish people, have dismissed Yeshua as Israel's Messiah. And yet, at the same time, many more Greeks and Romans have received him as Savior. What is Paul supposed to do about that? What is the body of Messiah supposed to do about that? With 
many of Paul's own kinfolk having dismissed their own Messiah, and many of these people from the nations at large having received him. Many of the Greek and Roman believers were in severe danger of becoming prideful, arrogant, superior toward the Jewish people, not unlike many of their pagan contemporaries. And so you see Paul in Romans 9, 10, and 11 trying to sort through this whole matter. His own kinfolk, his own flesh and blood on the whole, have widely dismissed their own Messiah. And he wants to guard against non-Jewish believers becoming prideful, arrogant, haughty, superior. Instead, he wants them to be turned toward positive action in seeing Jewish people, the Jewish community, positively impacted. So within that discussion, you see this concept of non-Jewish believers from the nations grafted in to the olive tree, which is Israel, Jeremiah 11, 16, and 17, Hosea 14, 1 through 7, but they're grafted in as wild olive branches. And it doesn't mean that they come in and replace the natural branches. It doesn't even mean that they are 100% indistinguishable from the natural olive branches. They are wild olive branches, which means they are going to have some differences compared to the natural branches. It is a mistake for anyone to claim that Jewish and non-Jewish believers in Israel's Messiah are 100% identical. If we were to push the envelope and say that they would be 87%, 90%, 93% identical, they're still 7% non-identical. So... I believe, and I've said this many times, it's right for us to stress our commonality first, but there are still going to be differences. So being grafted in as a wild olive branch does not mean that one is 100% identical to the natural olive branch, but they're both olives, olive branches. They have more in common than not. But the grafting in of wild olive olive branches from the nations into Israel's olive tree is something qualified. It is conditional. Romans 11, 17 through 24. This is actually important for ecclesiology. It stresses that, yes, non-Jewish believers are a part of Israel's polity, part of that commonwealth of Israel, part of that enlarged kingdom realm of Israel, of Tabernacle of David, Amos 9, 11, and 12. But there are warnings issued as well. Paul's purpose was to, yes, these wild olive branches from the nations grafted into Israel's olive tree, absolutely. But it comes with some conditions to be aware of. Romans 11, 17 through 24. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree. Do not be arrogant toward the branches, but if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right, they were broken off for their unbelief but you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold then, the kindness and severity of God to those who fell, severity, but to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will those who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? 
So the analogy which the Apostle Paul uses, you have the olive tree from the Tanakh background, Jeremiah 11, 16 and 17, Hosea 14, 1 through 7. It is Israel. It is the polity of Israel. Described elsewhere as the commonwealth of Israel, the Israel of God, the tabernacle of David in the process of being restored. Because of the unbelief of various Jewish people, the natural branches, God has broken them off. And that has allowed a place for wild olive branches from the nations to be grafted in. But Paul issues a severe warning. Do not be arrogant toward the natural branches which have been broken off. Instead, be very fearful. God is powerful enough to regraft natural branches from the Jewish people back into their own olive tree. And if he's able to do that, he is just as powerful to break off branches which have been grafted in, wild branches from the nations. So Romans 11, 17 through 24, while it is the source of many non-Jewish believers in today's Messianic community saying that I'm a wild olive branch grafted into the tree of Israel. Okay, but it's not something which is to produce pride or arrogance or a superior attitude toward Jewish people or even the Messianic Jewish community, which is still working through various issues. By the way, we're all working through various issues because we're human. Instead, Paul wants to see the wild branches from the nations which have been grafted into the olive tree. He wants them to be moved with God's kindness, God's mercy. Romans 11.22, let me read this again. Behold then the kindness and severity of God to those who fell severity, but to you God's kindness if you continue in his kindness, otherwise also you will be cut off. Now the solution for wild branches grafted into the olive tree is stated further on in Romans 11 verses 30 and 31. This is what I believe non-Jewish believers were supposed to be doing in the first century CE. And I especially believe that if you are a non-Jewish believer involved in the sphere of influence of messianic things, you need to especially be aware of this. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so these also now have been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. New American Standard. Think about that for a moment. Because of the mercy shown to you, they now, in turn, may be shown mercy. Now, what does that mean? I think it's fairly obvious. Non-Jewish believers and Israel's Messiah grafted into the olive tree as wild branches, recognizing that natural branches had to be broken off rather than be prideful, arrogant, superior, damning, embracing supersessionism, replacement theology. Instead, they're to be vessels of God's grace, God's mercy. They're to demonstrate the blessings of Israel's Messiah to the natural branches. And of course, the big challenge with this is that we have seldom seen this occur at all throughout religious history since. Now, you've seen it in part over the past few centuries with the rise of different evangelistic groups wanting to reach out with God's love and mercy and Messiah to the Jewish community, and then later with the emergence of the Hebrew Christian, and now with the Messianic uh, Jewish community, you see non-Jewish believers genuinely moved as vessels of God's grace, mercy, kindness, wanting to help, wanting to stand in solidarity with their Jewish neighbors, stand against anti-Semitism, 
take an active interest in the affairs of the Jewish community, understand the Jewish experience throughout history. I believe that is what Paul is trying to communicate to his ancient Greek and Roman readers in Romans 11 and to us today. Non-Jewish believers and the sphere of influence of Messianic things, especially at this critical phase of its development, are they, are you, am I even, trying to be a vessel of God's grace, mercy, kindness, and understanding to, first, my fellow Messianic Jewish brothers and sisters, as I get to know them, know what their background is, their life story, and does that translate over to the Jewish community as a whole? Now, one of the things which has doubtlessly prompted some of these discussions about how do we guard against replacement theology? Today, if the social media numbers are true, the independent Hebrew roots or the non-Jewish Torah movements outnumber those who are involved with the Messianic Jewish movement, about 50 to 1. And it's easily discerned that most of the non-Jewish Torah movements, and I would say that a majority of the people involved in the non-Jewish Torah movements, do not often have that genuine a concern or an interest for what it means to be a vessel of God's grace, mercy, or understanding toward the Jewish people. If anything, they tend to be very hostile, not only to the positive contributions of evangelical Protestantism, but also the positive contributions of the Jewish synagogue. To put it very bluntly, they're not that concerned about the well-being of their Jewish neighbors. And in fact, it's easily discerned with some of the non-Jewish Torah movements that in just assuming a blatant identity of Israel, unqualified, that they're not only promoting some form of supersessionism or replacement theology, but even anti-Semitism. Movements like the Two House sub-movement, the non-Jewish people involved in that, claiming some kind of unprovable identity as scattered Ephraim, the Northern Kingdom, while often wanting to have unity with the Jewish people who they identify as the Southern Kingdom of Judah, they haven't cared that much for issues of Judaism, Jewish tradition, or the Jewish experience. If they did, you wouldn't see things like their affluent usage of the sacred name or the different calendars. If anything, they'd want to align as closely as they could with Judaism. The One Law or One Torah sub-movement, it started out uh, in the late 1990s and early 2000s aughts as being very pro-Jewish and very pro-Jewish tradition. But now with some of the younger successors coming on board, you don't see that anymore. You see more hostility toward mainline Jewish traditions and customs. And it has very complicated relations with Messianic Judaism. Some of it, I think, being rooted in the personalities of some of the older men involved, but not really and any effort to want to focus on common things first and then wanting to work through and recognize the mistakes which have been made. Hebrew roots, we've discussed that. That's all over the board. Uh, but when you ask Hebrew roots people, what about Jewish roots? You know, Hebrew roots, especially 20 years ago, that was used to emphasize one's faith heritage and the Tanakh scriptures, Hebrew language study, Jewish roots more, Second Temple Judaism, ancient Jewish literature from both before and after the time of the Messiah, and also perhaps some modern Jewish perspectives. Hebrew roots tends to 
be very hostile and certainly negatively inclined toward matters of Judaism. And then there is now the question mark of pro-Namian Christianity. How concerned is it going to be for matters of Israel, the Jewish people, and Judaism? I'm not going to hold my breath based on what I've seen in previous history. Now, what is one of the most significant ways, and we'll close off with this, what is one of the most significant ways that non-Jewish believers within the sphere of influence of things messianic, how can they easily brush aside any claim that in saying that they are part of the commonwealth of Israel, they're grafted into Israel's olive tree, they're part of the Israel of God, tabernacle of David being restored. How can they easily deflect any claim of supersessionism or replacement theology? It's very easy. They need to be able to work and collaborate side by side as co-laborers with Messianic Jewish believers in the restoration of Israel. Now, if Jewish people out there who do not recognize Yeshua as Israel's Messiah, they consider Messianic Judaism itself to be supersessionist, replacement theology, cosplay, they're not really Jews. That is something they're going to have to take up with the God of Israel himself because this is an important salvation historical movement. But if non-Jewish believers want to legitimately deflect and brush off any claim of replacement theology or supersessionism, then they need to expel some effort to co-labor and work and collaborate in kingdom matters with Messianic Jewish believers. Now, that's very easily done if a non-Jewish believer is a part of a Messianic congregation. And so you're attending Shabbat services every week. You're involved in their annual appointed times, the biblical feasts. And you might be going with groups from your local Messianic congregation to major Messianic conference events like the Messiah Conference in Grantham, Pennsylvania. Things like that. If you don't have a Messianic congregation nearby, which is a dilemma that many face because many uh, of the non-Jewish believers within the sphere of influence of Messianic things, they don't live in a major metropolitan area where there are Messianic congregations. They might live in a more rural area, or it might be a 90-minute drive or a two-hour drive to visit that Messianic congregation. They need to be sure that by their actions, by their praxis, they are demonstrating that they are involved in the nexus of the Messianic Jewish mission of Jewish evangelism, Jewish outreach, Israel solidarity. And it is for many of those people that those week-long or weekend-long conference-level events can be a lifeline. And fortunately, one of the good things about the internet and social media is that they can be involved and they can plug into the worship service of a Messianic congregation. Uh, but the main thing that non-Jewish believers involved in Messianic things need to do is they need to demonstrate a genuine and active concern for working with Jewish believers in Yeshua and working to advance the Messianic mission. That is not something, unfortunately, we see too often in the non-Jewish Torah movements. It's also stressed, and this is something which uh, I have talked about many times, and I suspect that I will, in the not-too-distant future, talk about some of my personal experiences. Non-Jewish believers do, especially at this phase of development, they do have to be specially called by the Lord into the Messianic movement. And why is this the case? Is it because we want to see people turned away? 
I think on the part of many Messianic Jewish believers, it is a protection mechanism. They want to make sure that the non-Jewish believers who are coming into their congregations, God genuinely wants them. They're not just there because they've tried this religious experience, that denomination, that group, and the Messianic movement is just another option uh, on the buffet. They want non-Jewish believers who are genuinely called and for the non-Jewish believers themselves. Sooner or later, there's going to be something about the Messianic experience you don't like, or it rubs you the wrong way. And that's when you will be challenged. Am I called into this? Am I really supposed to be here? And it may not be obvious at first what that is, but we have all, as non-Jewish believers in the Messianic community, had an experience that we didn't like. While for many non-Jewish believers, their initial motivation for coming into the Messianic movement is wanting to reconnect to their faith heritage and the scriptures of Israel, partaking of things like Shabbat, the festivals, a kosher style of diet, getting involved in some kind of weekly Torah study, wanting to live more like Yeshua and his first followers, and yes, even serving as co-laborers alongside of Jewish believers in the restoration of Israel. Oh, this is so exciting. Sooner or later, there's going to be something that they don't like, and that is when their ongoing loyalty and fidelity to the Messianic movement will be prompted, to say the least. And For myself, I, having been involved in the Messianic community for 27 and a half, almost 28 years now, have seen many non-Jewish believers from evangelical backgrounds not last. Uh, I have, you know, a proverbial three-year rule. Well, if they get through three years of this, then they'll probably end up staying. Some of our favorite television shows, yeah, if they last about three seasons, You can probably expect a fourth season. Many do make it. Many do not. And that is, I think, one of the reasons why it is stressed, are you called into this? Uh, Because sooner or later, there's going to be something that you don't like. And that is when you see, well, I can't believe I wasted three years of my life with this, or however long it was. You know, how do we know that they're not wrong? How do we guard against replacement theology? It also involves having a big picture salvation historical orientation. Not a day-to-day or week-to-week or month-to-month orientation. A short-timer mindset. You have to have a long-term mindset. And so with that in mind, uh, as I was putting my notes together this week on how do we guard against replacement theology, part two. And this will not be the last time we talk about supersessionism, replacement theology. But evaluating this whole subject matter of non-Jewish believers have to be called and forecasting that we will be discussing some very spicy issues in the not-too-distant future putting my notes together, and having a few interactions with some people this week. Next time, we are planning to discuss Navigating Messianic Pluralism. And I'm just going to go ahead and say part one. I expect this will be two parts. But what we'll be doing is we'll be going through the Messianic Apologetics Outreach Israel Ministries Statement of Faith, and we're going through it section by section, to evaluate how can you handle a plurality of theological views in the Messianic community, which would not necessarily be seen in evangelicalism. So you'll definitely want to be looking forward to that because we are going to be using some of those discussions to get into some of the more spicier topics, which ultimately are not salvation issues, but They can be treated as salvation issues, and they don't tend to be things which we handle very well as Messianic people, but we have to talk about it because 
we do live in a world where these are being discussed. We intersect with the Jewish and Christian worlds where these matters are being discussed. So be looking forward to that next time. As always, on behalf of Outreach Israel Ministries and Messianic Apologetics, I would like to sincerely thank you for your ongoing prayers and support for our ministry efforts. We'll see you again next time with another episode of Messianic Insider. Until then, God bless you. Take care. Shalom.